everybody. Welcome to the Adobe webinar, Frictionless Data Capture, Save Money and Build a Better Experience. We are delighted to welcome you here today, whether it is morning, afternoon or evening for you. Thank you for giving us your time and we hope you find this a really interesting and insightful session. The motivation behind us running this webinar is something that's uh, quite common, I think. All of us as individuals will have experienced both the best and the worst of customer onboarding experiences in our own private lives. That can be paper-based systems that require time and effort. Not everyone has a printer anymore. I know I certainly don't. But also we know that where that experience is digitized, that makes it much, much easier for our customers. And the result and the outcome of that is likely to be much better customer engagement and overall lifetime value. In terms of exploring what that means, though, not just for the individual, because I think we would all agree in our own experience that making that experience easier is likely to be outcome, a positive outcome for the customers. What we also want to look at is understanding the impact that digitization has on those actual organization themselves in terms of thinking about not just about customer value, customer spend, but actually driving real and significant operational efficiencies. That means freeing up the time of people behind the scenes, removing redundant processes, and actually what that can mean in terms of value for your business from a cost saving perspective. That's what we're hoping to discuss in more detail today. And joining us to do that, we have two special guests who I'm delighted to welcome. First, we have Alex Hamilton. Alex joins us from Wonderman Thompson, and his role is that of head of Wonderman Thompson Technologies data capture practice. So this is very much his bread and butter. In this and in prior roles, he's developed a really deep understanding of the journeys and processes which are common in financial services operations and all organizations who have a need for data capture and onboarding processes, which is obviously a broad range of different businesses. This has enabled him to develop a framework and set of tools, some of which you'll see today, which allows him to assign value to those operational efficiencies and to quantify the benefits for you and your business of moving to that digitized future. We're also really delighted to welcome from Adobe, Richard Ramsamuge, who is a senior manager in strategic development here, focused on the application of FinTech to re-engineer processes and workflows within predominantly financial services organizations for exactly that goal of digitization and efficiency. But not only is he technically an expert, he also, prior to joining Adobe, spent 25 years of his personal experience in retail, wealth, and corporate banking. So his understanding of the challenges and needs across this space is second to none and comes from deep personal experience over those years, as well as just from the Adobe perspective. So hopefully his insights will be very, very relevant for everybody. So I'm really keen that we get started with today's session, but first, before I do, I want to make it clear that this is an interactive session and we will be opening up for Q&A once our speakers have finished with uh, the core presentation. We're very keen that people get involved, take notes, send us questions and comments, and we're really keen to discuss those with you at the end of the session. So do get involved with us if there's anything that you'd like to discuss in more detail, and we look forward to seeing those questions. So next, we're going to run through a quick industry overview, uh, given where the current global environment exists from a financial services perspective with the uh, onment of COVID-19. So the global challenge of COVID-19 has spurred a significant innovation effort from organizations and the financial services industry. Within financial services in particular, so items like robotic uh, process automation, uh, those tools are assisting in the processing of thousands of customer and employee requests, extracting data from intuitive, living, breathing documents. Smart devices are monitoring what we do, where we go and what we consume, collecting valuable data transparently uh, in the background not historic data as has been the case in the past, but real time data that allows organizations to respond to customer demands on the fly by promoting products and services based on anywhere that you might be in terms of your location. The creative and enticing offer of a product 
brings customers to the front door. However, that data that is collected as we move from one product to another in terms of any request that we might make is rarely and does rarely travel with you, even though it might be collected by the same organization. And this is where the frustration starts for most customers. As customers of digitally savvy retailers, we are presented with onboarding concepts that capture the very essence of the human and artificial intelligence collaboration as information collected at source with your permission, of course, is used to create experiences that are tailored for you. And when you return for another product, all of your details are present and there is no need to re-enter information unless changes are required. And this is where the similarities differ in the customer acquisition of a product or a service from a bank or an insurance company. In their quest to accelerate, adopting technologies to digitally transform business processes to drive customer loyalty, it remains frustrating for a customer who, with the same organization, has to enter personal details twice over as internal applications are not joined up and do not share data between each other to offer a seamless, friction-free customer experience. Banks are in inherently siloed and a victim essentially of their own rapid success where solutions were required to meet the needs and, and demands of customers, thus creating pools of independent data environments. This is critical now for banks to think medium and long-term as the immediate need for technology innovation is only half of the equation and half the story. People's values have shifted and people's values continue to shift and the digital age technology models that are created today must maintain a sync with those values. Today's reality is that technology is no longer an option. It is a requirement to connect employees, consumers and business partners enabling customers to stay connected, always on and always available. Digital or challenger banks have given the traditional bricks and mortar banks a glance at the future, delivering digital experiences that are digital first, and that is no paper and no wet signature. And they do this through mobile channels where your data literally follows you around. It isn't just about transforming processes that are visible to the customer. If the middle and back office environments are not digitized as well, then the fulfillment process slows, thus reducing the overall customer experience. Compliance and regulation continue to play a major role in how customers' data is collected and shared. And technologies that drive greater innovation whilst meeting these challenges allow for the creation of cloud platforms that facilitate customer experiences, which can be taken to another level. Customers authenticating onto financial services portals can now be instructed to execute transactions following an intensive identity and verification process where the provision of government issued documents and data are used to authenticate an individual thus providing banks with continually updated, personally identifiable information, which aids their KYC process and satisfies the regulators. Okay, so Richard's been through a bit of an industry overview as to where things are from a, I guess, digitization of paper perspective. And often for organizations, the first step in doing something about that digitization um, process is understanding what is the benefit to your company by doing that. So um, the starting point for this generally is, you know, what's, what is the cost of paper? What, what's the cost being associated with paper to your business? Um, and there's some, there's a variety of different studies out there, some which put a, a vague figure of about $20 per sheet of paper that enters your organization. Um, but often what's needed is a little bit more detail into understanding the particular nuances and processes um, associated with paper and then attributing a cost to them 
so that you can start building a business case to, to fuel and to fund that digitization process um, and to take your experiences beyond um, paper-based journeys, which uh, I, I think today are considered a bit out of date. So in this section, what I'm going to go through, um, I've got a few anecdotes of things I've seen personally in the last few years, um, some of which are quite hard to believe still happening today, but I'm sure that a lot of you will understand um, and see these sorts of things firsthand every day. Um, and then I've got some cost areas, um, different areas of cost associated with paper to look into. Um, and then finally, um, we, we completed a, a value exercise uh, with one of our clients a few months ago. Um, and I just want to take you through the process that we did there so you can understand the, the sorts of things we do in order to start building up that business case to do something around digitization of paper. Um, so before I dive into these uh, different cost areas that I've put on screen, and just to note, these aren't an exhaustive list uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I just want to let you into a, a couple of things that I've seen over the last few years. Um, I guess a lot of you be aware of regulations like MIFID 2 and changing regulations around um, data and the sorts of data that you need to hold on somebody for a particular reason. Um, often these, these regulatory changes and introductions of new regulations mean that there is a requirement to reach out to your customers um, and, and get access to new data points that you haven't had before. And one of the cases I was working on, um, I, was, I was working with an operations center uh, in the UK for a bank. And after MIFID II, there was a data point that was missing for a lot of customers, millions of customers actually around the world. Um, and what they did to retrieve that data point, I think it was something like um, country of residence, no, tax residency. Uh, it was tax residency. Um, in order to get that missing data point from those customers, they actually sent out millions of letters um, to each of those customers with a form that needed to be filled in to request uh, that particular missing data point. And as you can imagine, the cost associated with sending out millions of letters is, is actually pretty significant in itself. But then of those millions of customers, how many do you think actually responded to that letter? Um, well, it was less than 50%. So then the remainder got sent a second letter and then they got sent a third letter. Um, and then after that, um, each of the missing data points was actually assigned to a, um, an RM, a relationship manager inside the bank to reach out and find um, the contact details of that person, whether it's phone over email to get a hold of them. And then when they'd found them and got a hold of them, they actually sent them another letter containing a form that needs to be filled out to complete that that missing data point. Um, and you're starting to see the picture there in that particular instance, by not having a digital mechanism to um, retrieve data points quickly and relying on paper-based processes, we've sent millions and millions of letters. And I don't even know what a second class envelope costs right now. I think it's about 30p. First class is 80p maybe. Um, so just in postage costs alone, we're looking at millions, like millions of pounds in from one missing data point for one regulation. And these things happen all the time. Um, so over the course of a, a whole business, lots of different operation centers, lots of different uh, exceptions and missing and things that you need to contact the customer about, what is that costing you? Um, and for this particular business that we were working with, that was actually just that the case of the missing data point that we use to build a business case to start a digitization program, um, creating a mechanism to, to retrieve that data digitally rather than rely on, um, I guess, paper-based channels. An another interesting case study I had, uh, um, have, have seen over the last couple of years is just sort of highlighting some of the processes as people start to embark on digitization. Um, and this revolves around in branch activities. So when someone goes into a banking branch and they fill out a form or they're trying to do something like change, uh, add an account, a joint signer, for example, or uh, amend a direct debit, and they, they get presented with a piece of paper in the branch of this particular bank. Now, at the end of the day, all of the branches, what they do is they package up all of their 
um, all of their paper-based forms, their paper-based mail, and they ship it. They fly it out to Indonesia for sorting and for processing. Um, so you've got you know shipping costs and a time delay associated with with that action at the same time, um, and also the paper cost as well. Let's not forget that paper costs money, as does ink. So all of that adds up. Now, once it arrived in Indonesia, um, it was actually unpacked and sorted into different types and then passed to different processing teams. Um, once we got into these processing teams, what they would do is they'd scan it and they'd do OCR. Um, so try and pick out electronically what the words are um, on, that, on that piece of paper. And I think historically, OCR is not a new technology, but it's not considered to be great. It's improving with artificial intelligence. Um, but it's, it's by no means perfect. So once it had been scanned and OCR'd, um, actually the next step was to get that data into the backend systems. And this was done manually. So they had teams of people sat there typing out this information. Um, and then there was a verification check. So someone would check the work of the person who's typed that information and verify it against the scan um, of, of that piece of paper that had been received. Um, and after all this was done, that the paper was then sent back to the UK so that it can be archived and stored in a way that uh, meets the, the regulations associated with those pieces of paper. Um, and over the course of a year with many different branches, again, the, the cost of just this back office activity, not even taking into account um, the, the cost of running those operating centers or the staff members involved in their time, purely materials and shipping was running into uh, tens or at least t over 10 million pounds on an annual basis um, for those branch activities. Huge amounts of money. And you know, wh when you're looking at sums of that magnitude, you can start seeing a way to create an, an interesting uh, business case um, that should get you started on a digitization program. Um, and then finally, I, I guess I have a, a last anecdote from the lockdown and just, I guess this is less to do with the there's the specific cost, but something worth mentioning, and it's kind of important later on when we look at, the, you know, the areas um, and and the, you know, what lies beneath the water after a data has been received by an organisation. What's that process behind the scenes? Um, this one was really interesting to me because um, this particular organisation, when the lockdown in the UK struck uh, last year, they did not know what to do because their operating process for processing data involved quite a um, in-person set of steps, uh, which included somebody's job was to fill out an Excel spreadsheet containing the different cases of um, forms being received on that day for a particular action. Like I can't go into too many details. What they'd then do is they'd walk into the middle of their office and they'd stick it up on a wall divider. And each, each of, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, each of the operating teams would come in with a highlighting pen and then with their color on it and they'd highlight the cases that they'd want to do that day and then they'd sort of take away get the case numbers and then enter them in so they can continue about their work um, but you can imagine when when you're not allowed to step into the office and you're not allowed to leave home how do you how do you ensure continuity when you've got processes like that um, underpinning your your operations it just it doesn't work so in that instance, obviously, there's a there's a dire need, not just from a cost perspective, but from a you know operational resilience perspective to have a digital mechanism to do these things in case um, exceptional circumstances are thrown upon you such that you can't get into an office. Um, and I, I'm, this year I've had several conversations um, with, with different organizations um, around the world, and a lot of them are now looking at um, options of um, taking that problem and abstracting it away from their core business, starting with doing things like a digital mailroom, which is a very interesting um, proposition right now. Um, anyway, I'm digressing. Let's get into attributing the the, the cost of paper um, and, and trying to assign value to it. And I've, I've just thrown up here um, a, a couple of areas that you can look into for, um, I guess, sectioning off the different areas that might associate the, the cost of having paper-based processes. We've touched on a few of them. You've got the paper itself, um, the cost of the mailroom, the mailroom staff, and the scanning machines, repairs, um, running those scans, and, and the teams and time associated with them. Then you've got operations and fulfillment, 
Um, so this is the team that has to typically do your um, checks on the data, maybe signature validation, anti-money laundering, other KYC checks um, associated with that process. And then they'll push that data into, into backend systems or at least into a staging area. Um, typically, this is still done manually, particularly where you've got manual based paper coming in, they have to type it in. Um, and if, if you're looking to make sure the data is clean and correct, then um, I guess in more circumstances than not, you will have a verification step. So you'll have somebody checking the work of that initial data entry. Um, and that has a time associated, a time implication associated with it. Um, now with paper-based uh, journeys and paper-based data, you've obviously got the, the, the chance of a lot of exceptions. Uh, I mean, there's so many this can hang, ha have, or there are so many areas um, of, of exceptions and so many cause of exceptions. Typically, if you look at my handwriting, I can't read it. How is someone else going to read it? And when they're trying to decipher what I've put in my address or um, what I've written down as a fund that I want to invest in or, or some details that I want to change about my account type, um, they're not going to be able to read it. And if they can't read it, they can't enter it, and they have to get back to me, and I have to retell them that information. And every time you raise an exception, think about your process flow um, of, of getting access to that data. You're, you're starting from scratch again. You're sending them a new form to fill out, or you're um, maybe even asking your contact center to phone someone up. And a contact center obviously has a a cost associated with it as well, which brings me on to the next point, which is the help desk costs. Um, th some European figures would would put it down that every every time a help desk is called somewhere in Europe, that call costs at least 15 euros to the organization that receives it. Um, other organizations will have more or less depending on you know where their contact centers lie and the, the other operational costs associated with them. But that's a typically good uh, ballpark figure to use for this. So every time you have an exception or, or someone's not sure of the process they need to follow to give the information, so they're calling your help desk. Each of these areas is, is having a huge cost impact on your business. Um, so what do we do about it? We document it and we figure it out and we work out what those processes are um, so that we can help build a business case to build a platform that digitizes as much of this as possible um, and starts reducing the costs that we've just highlighted right here. Um, I'm going to go into um, a use case that we worked on over uh, the last couple of months with one of our clients. Um, it's a very large FSI customer of ours. Um, and in a lot of areas, they're very modern. You take a look at their website. It doesn't look out of place. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's not bad looking. It's actually a very good design, a very good user experience. It's just that a lot of the journeys associated with with capturing data about people are, um, if not broken, in that they've got a maybe a digital front end experience. Um, they might still need some paper for certain journey types, but in the back end, a lot of what happens is still still very manual. Um, and historically, if we look at why this is, it's because a lot of these organisations have been built up and had their operating models designed around the fact that the document of record is still that piece of paper, that immutable object that you can carry around and sign and file away in a cabinet somewhere. Um, and, and the processes haven't been digitized. So what we do, um, or what we did with this organization, is we we basically built up a very large spreadsheet of um, costs associated with one particular paper-based journey by looking at some of those buckets that I flashed up on my screen earlier. Um, and we drew out a process flow diagram of the different touch points associated with that particular journey. Um, and, and what this allowed us to do was to basically portion off and say, for this step in the process, these are roughly the costs associated with that particular step. Um, and we took this to other paper-based processes and other operating teams in the same business. And by doing that, what we were able to do is to showcase this you know, quite specific narrow journey um, to a wider set of stakeholders. And then they were able to see, well, actually, I have the same problem there. I've got similar process and I'm, I'm wondering whether it's costing me the same amount of money or a similar amount of money. Um, and in doing so created this, I guess, conjoined unit of stakeholders with a very similar set of problems. 
And when you look at the, the cost of those problems um, altogether, your, your business case becomes lots, uh, sort of a lot more interesting. And that's actually important when I come back um, after, after Richard's great talk about the future, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the sort of how to get there, how, what to do with this business case and how to use it effectively to, to roadmap your way um, towards a, a digital mechanism for handling data. So many thanks, Alex. So what we're going to look at now is what um, is perceived for the banks to be what the future should and could look like. In each of these three slides, or as a combination of these, these are elements that are absolutely paramount to financial services. And for these organizations that want to meet, meet the need of the customers of tomorrow and providing that ultimate experience that customers will crave. The artificial intelligence is essentially a digital first. And in essence, this technology and this technology uh, alone cannot define a successful bank, but artificial intelligence will define banks of the future. Disruptive AI technologies integrated across various segments of the customer interaction dramatically improve banks' performance in a number of key areas, driving increased profits, real-time personalization, and device smart omnichannel experiences, which is key for our for most customer interaction today. That's having the ability to do something or start something uh, on the web, uh, continue it either on a laptop, a tablet or a mobile device. And these particular omnichannel experiences will be something that separates whether a customer does business with one organization or another. And these will absolutely give rise to rapid innovation, allowing the servicing of customer experiences, both virtually and within, say, a single video call. Before I continue with AI, let's go back to the video call piece. And, and that has reared its head, um, certainly over the last 18 months, given what has happened um, to us globally. If I look at um, banks as a, as, a, as a particular focus on where they are looking to take video banking, so servicing customers face-to-face -face is steeped in uh, 300 year ish history with the banks. And this is how banks essentially conducted business. It was a handshake, it was a promissory note, it was a wet signature, sometimes or most often not with a, a quill signature. And these processes often took weeks or months to conclude, either in public houses or uh, branches where frock coats were de rigueur uh, at the time. These branches became mini hubs on the high streets, and this is where all of the customer's needs could be met from printing checkbooks to buying foreign currency or storing family heirlooms in their vast safes. Branches were essentially well resourced with an entire structure of individuals from cashiers to admin clerks to bank managers who acquired their skills and knowledge as their careers uh, progressed. So they were able to service customers from a single branch with any request. Fast forward to the 20th century, and this witnessed what essentially was the rise and fall of the bank branch estate, slowly succumbing to advances in technology, where the centralization of bank services and competition were paid to some of the branch, the branch estates along the high streets. So this necessitated a branch rationalization program and strategy. So banks wanted to reduce their exposure to the high street and essentially the very consumers and the small medium enterprises that contributed to their revenues and ultimately their success. Along came the 21st century and technology evolution accelerated branch closures as banks embarked on what essentially was a customer acquisition program through smart devices and providing those digitally savvy with banking as a service, which was always connected anytime, um, anywhere. Challenger banks, as I mentioned earlier, entered the mix, creating niche digital offerings 
that appealed to obviously the younger demographics, which created healthy competition with the banks. But 2019 brought a different dimension to to banking uh, in terms of COVID-19. The customers could no longer see a banker face to face. They wanted to execute deals, but nobody wanted to attend a branch. Nobody wanted to stand in a queue, either in front or behind someone, not knowing whether that person was possibly um, suffering from an infection. And there needed to be new ways of connecting with and conducting business. And that, and that new way of connecting with a customer to include agreements as required to execute in a transaction could now and now will only be done through channels like using uh, the video. Artificial intelligence, though, makes the decision making uh, a seamless process, but also leverages capabilities to create immediate value that changes the operator model and creates a culture of new ways of working, which promotes digital transformation and a friction free customer experience. The byproduct from this determines how these organizations leverage also their employees, providing them with additional tools and capabilities to deliver exceptional value for each customer at scale. The need for speed also is essential now from a customer experience perspective. So externally, as consumers and businesses increasingly rely on technologies in daily life, banks are shifting the foundation of their business models from embedded products and experiences, but the latter becoming the more salient element of a customer's relationship with the bank. This shift creates a rapid increase in the number of customers being serviced at the same time with automated products and service approvals, which improve the revenues associated with each of these transactions. A, another simple scenario here is that with existing customers of banks, and if we're looking at something like uh, the commer commercial or corporate customer, they could have facilities agreed on an annual basis of, of rather large amounts, but they're drawing down segments throughout the year. And for each of those segments that they're having to draw down, they're still having to provide uh, documentation, paper, wet signatures and schedules to the bank to approve a drawdown of a loan where a bigger, um, a, a bigger facility has already been agreed. So this could take anything from five days to 10 days to 15 to 20 days. The banks make the primary revenue and income from their customers from lending. And if you already have a facility that's agreed, but you can't deposit that money into someone's account before additional documents and papers are being presented and signed, then the banks are continually daily losing huge amounts of interest from loans that have been agreed. So this, this is a fundamental change, and this is a fundamental change that where not so long ago, customers conducted business by visiting a branch once or twice a month, or conducting transactions several times a week through the banking websites. But now interaction daily with the bank through mobile banking apps or wearable devices is what's coming around the corner and most of these are already here. So in short, banks and their customers now have an interconnected relationship which satisfies the need for speed. So as we move on to the data lake, which will allow what I believe to be solutionizing of the go. So the last 14 months has brought, uh, certainly brought forward a, a channel shift and in particular, um, a digital migration by around two to four years. So banks now have what is considered to be a wealth of customer data, which can be used to predict and prioritize customer requirements on the go without the customer having to call a contact center. So by using this data and the customer's location, which can be made uh, available and visible whilst the customer is actually using the mobile banking app can influence a sale. So for example, the smart device can tell the banking app that the customer is uh, near a shopping mall 
uh, and the banking app sees that the customer is nearing the end of their current credit limit and automatically undertakes a credit check and concludes that the customer is eligible for a credit increase. So a pop-up appears on the phone advising the customer of uh, pre-approval of a credit limit and that increase can be applied for now by selecting and electronically uh, signing a pre-filled form using electronic signatures. The limit is updated uh, immediately and this is shown in the banking app for the customer to uh, uh, go and use and spend. The combination of these three items drive digital channel innovation and can mobilize the data that create unique digital experiences and automation which can be delivered both at speed and at scale. Okay, so we've had an industry overview. We've gone through the process of creating a business case that shows you know, what's the cost of not digitizing. And then we've seen the future from Richard and it looks great, but how do we get there? How do we, how do we get to this future? Um, this isn't the easy part, by the way, this is, this is the complex part. And actually what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of dive into this a little bit deeper and say, if we look at the neo banks of today, so your Monzo's, your Revolut's, your N26's, and they offer a seamless digital process for onboarding and everything they do is digital. Um, and they've, they've seemingly done that, you know, very quickly, very, uh, very succinctly, very well, very smooth. And it hasn't cost them, um, a fortune. Maybe it has, but it's not, it's not something that you, uh, would associate with a, a you know, a vast change product or project because there's no change. What they've done is they've built from the ground up digitally first. And they don't have that legacy to unpick and that technical debt to unpick um, and those operating procedures to unpick. And, and what that shows us is actually where should we be looking um, for the complexity and, and the problems associated with creating these digital experiences. Um, so what I'm going to talk about in this part is, I guess, how do we start looking at creating a roadmap? To this digitization and, and the first thing to say is that creating a, a web form to capture data is easy it's not complicated at all um, you can do it in a lot of different technologies um, a lot of different technologies there's a lot of solutions out there that will help you do it um, and really it's it's you know the simplest part of that journey um, and again relaying back or, or thinking back to um, trying to understand where the complexity lies and why this hasn't been done. What we have to do is think about everything that happens once that that submit button has been hit on the form, once the data has been passed on somewhere. Um, so when you when you submit data or when you're dealing with data and onboarding, there's two parts to the process in the organization. You've got the data on one side and then you've got the document of record on the other side. Um, and with a piece of paper, those two are joined together, right? You've got someone writing on the piece of paper and you've got the data and the document record together. And all of the processes that happen behind the scenes inside that organization, they'll be centered around um, abstracting that data, taking that data off the document of record, and then rekeying it into other systems and verifying it and making sure it's okay. And then um, taking that document of record and, and filing it somewhere. Um, and, and those are the processes that have to change if you want to do it digitally, because what you've done is you've taken that data and you've, you've unpicked it and you've got it and it's fresh and it's clean and it's, it's ready to do stuff with. Um, but at the same time with a digital process, you can also create a digital document of record. Um, and you can, you know, send that straight to the archival facility, um, so that you can sort of keep it as a, as a record for if you might need it later on. Um, so, so where I'm going with this is, um, what you need to start doing is understanding, you know, currently what your processes are and then do a bit of a change map to understand where they need to get to and what might change if you're dealing with data, um, separate from that document of record. And typically the areas you're going to need to look into are things like, um, signatures, uh, compliance regulations, 
integration, that's another big one. And the security around all of that um, has, is, is absolutely paramount because when you're dealing with a customer's data, um, the last thing you want is for somebody to post it on, on WikiLeaks or something like that. You, you want to make sure that it's secure um, and, and, you know, safely inside your firewall. But the benefit of doing this is abstracting the data is that's exactly how you can start getting to um, leveraging some of those interesting technologies that Richard was talking about, such as artificial intelligence and robotic process automation and data lakes. You have to get the data from somewhere. Um, and if you want to create this ideal utopia of straight through processing where somebody submits a form to open a bank account and not one person has to view that form or that process or touch it before that account is opened, then you know that data has to be um, clean and validated and pushed through this, um, I guess, this RPA process to decide which system gets it, why do they get it, um, what do they need to do with it, and where does it where does it need to end up? Um, so that's that's all kind of very interesting stuff. And I, I guess the other thing to mention in terms of complexity, I'm going to sort of go back to where we left off with the business case is that trying to do this or solve this problem, looking at one paper journey or one archaic or legacy journey in isolation, it's probably not going to make sense from a value perspective um, because the processes underneath it are so often so complicated. Um, if, if you're trying to solve it for one journey, you know, you're, you're having to change an operating model or an organizational structure just to deal with one operational process that might be a, you know, a, a member of a suite of over a hundred different operational processes inside your organization. Um, so what we need to do is actually take a step back and see whether we can create, I guess, a new um, team or a new operating model inside your organization that solely focuses on data capture, a platform. Um, if we go back 10, maybe more 15 years now, because the last five years has flown by, and you go into any large multinational corporation and you ask whether you can speak to their centralized marketing team or their centralized web management team, they'll look at you with a strange look on their face because it didn't exist. Um, what existed was these very siloed teams that would manage certain parts of their web real estate. They were using different technologies. Um, they were using their own processes, their own content, their own way of doing things, and they'd run things in a very siloed and regional way. Um, and if we look at documents and paper and processes like that, that, that sort of siloed setup is still the case today. You've got document owners who own that particular document and process, but they might sit in a completely different part of the organization to everyone else. Um, so that business case that we spoke about a little bit earlier on, that is the fuel to start saying, what we need to do is first identify the fact that our organization has to have some changes so that we can group together everyone with a need to capture that data and then create a common set of capability and a common set, a common way of doing things um, so that you can rationalize and, and start making huge economies of scale. And when you start doing that digitization effort, it's not just affecting one journey, it's affecting all of your digital journeys. Um, at the same time. So let's look back at Henry Ford and how he handled the actual industrialization. Um, what he said was, um, don't just give me one car to build. What I want you to do is task me with building a thousand cars, because then what I will do is I'll create um, an efficient way of producing them that you know leverages a production line where I'm getting really efficient mechanisms to put them together and repair them going forward. <clears throat> and for us, we want to do exactly the same thing, but with paper-based journeys and form-based journeys in order to digitize them. Don't just give us one. The operational efficiencies aren't there. The business case probably isn't there. Give us a thousand, because when we have a thousand journeys to look at, what we'll do is we'll take a step back and we'll look at all the common pieces that exist as part of those journeys. And those common pieces, we can start putting together into these building blocks um, to, to basically do that and drive that rapid digitization um, that, that Rich was speaking about in the future, in the future section. Um, and this is exactly where things start to get really exciting when you start putting together all of these different pieces. So you've got a production line of rapid digitization. 
Um, but actually, you've also got technology now where it leverages artificial intelligence to do that digitization for you. Uh, so instead of having to take a paper-based process and, and send it to a UX designer who's going to take a look at it and come up with a web-based form, you've now got tools that will look at how other paper-based journeys have been digitized into a web-based form and then create one for you automatically. <clears throat> so really, the main focus of your, your sort of journey towards digitization is understanding what those technologies are and how best to use them for that front-end digitization piece. But secondly, um, looking for the common areas and capabilities that you need from a back-end perspective, whether it's AI and um, robotic process automation, whether it's uh, a data lake with appropriate connectors in and out of your back-end systems, um, or whatever it might be, such as, a, I guess, an architectural pattern to submit data into your back-end systems. Those are the pieces you want to put together um, to handle all of your back-end processes and, and gain those operational efficiencies um, from, from digitizing. <clears throat> and if you generate a business case that enables you to do that, then um, what we can do as, a, as Adobe and Wonderman Thompson is we can actually come, come into your business and then start looking at how we can create this capability map and map it to your roadmap to do a true digital transformation that focuses on, on paper-based journeys and immature data capture journeys to something that sort of resembles, hopefully, quite closely the vision that, that Richard painted of the future. Um, and I mean, my personal view is that one day that there shouldn't be any need for forms at all. And forms should be defunct because um, what you're going to do is you're going to use the data you've got for somebody to do an action that they want to do. Um, maybe you need to validate that that data is current and, it, you know, they're happy for you to use it. But if you've got the data, all you need is some sort of signature or some sort of validation that, you know, they're giving their permission to do something. You don't need to send them a form anymore. And if you need a document of record, you can generate that digitally. Keep it all at the back end. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to hassle your customer with it. Um, and in the event you do need data, such as the, the missing data point associated with MIFID, then you don't send them a form to do it. You send them a chatbot request on WhatsApp um, and you just request that one missing piece of data and then that gets added to their, add, added to their profile. Um, so there we are, the, the vision of the future and how to get there and what it costs and what it costs not to do it. Um, and I hope everyone's found it very interesting. And thank you very much for listening in. I guess at this point, let's uh, tune in for any questions.